for me, once people start saying, you know, we have to fight racism, I'm an anti-racist, I'm, my, <laughs> I'm always slightly suspicious of people that phrase missions in that way because it's it sort of goes without saying i mean you don't you don't have schools declaring that they're going to fight pedophilia um that they're committed to ending um you know s trafficking and slavery i mean obviously if such a such a thing was going on in the school they would have a duty to deal with it um and if it were criminal report it <laughs> Hello, welcome to The Bad Law Show. I'm Anna Lutfi and I am excited today to have hauled into the studio the lovely Alka Sagal Cuthbert, oh, who is you. an educator and um, the director of Don't Divide Us, DDU, uh, which is a fairly recently formed organisation which you're going to talk to us about. Um, and when you described yourself to me earlier as an educator, uh, presumably you've got a, a, a background uh, before forming DDU, you've yeah. got a, you've got a background in education, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it and what DDU is all about, and what brought you from uh, where you were in education to to forming the organisation DDU. Well, thank you, Anna, so mm. much for inviting mm. me. Um, it's it's lovely to be here. Yeah, so my whole professional life of sort of I don't know 25, 30 years has been in education. So that's been teach most. Mostly that's been as a secondary school teacher, also as a lecturer, um, seminar tutor, and uh, more latterly researcher and writer since doing my PhD on the philosophy and sociology of education. So if you like, I have both sort of academic expertise and a lot of practical experience mm -hmm. in education, which is why I call myself an educator. I write periodically for academic publications, but also for more professional and public ones on education and broader cultural issues around that. Um, <clears throat> now, and I think that I think that is salient to "Don't Divide Us" because "Don't Divide Us" started off, and for the most part of its two-year existence, it has been a grassroots organisation um, that arose very much organically in response to the summer of 2020 and the BLM protests where and also after lockdown when a lot of parents um, responded to a, an open letter in the spectator about the George Floyd murder and the protests um, worry and, and, ex and articulated a concern that the public narratives being woven, if you like, in the media discussions and the kind of academic discussions around race were taking a very different turn to everything that we had known up to now, the kind of assumptions and beliefs. And it wasn't quite clear how it was different, but there was a sense that something very fundamentally different was being introduced, if you like, into the ether, and more worryingly being introduced in schools um, with very young children, with no scrutiny and no public discussion. Mm -hmm. So it was in response to that concern um, and the desire for people to continue meeting by Zoom week after week to air their frustrations and discuss ideas and give examples, share thoughts, experiences, etc. that Don't Divide Us emerged. And then sort of maybe about eight months, a year ago, we realised that what was we couldn't we would be limited if we continued in the same way we had started off we needed to professionalize and we needed to sort of sharpen the campaign and be, become more intentional um, and focused in our work and that's what that's where we're at I'm not saying we've got there yet but yeah. we're, that's that's we're in that process okay so the name don't divide us are you able to give us an example of, of something that was causing parents concern um, in, 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 in what was happening in their, in their child's school and link it to the choice of your name because it's quite a provocative name. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's almost common sense. You know, why would, why would any society want there to be division? Mm. Uh, you obviously see uh, some of what you've just described as sowing division. Can you perhaps give us an example of, of how that works in uh, practice? I certainly can. Oh, I'm yes. sure you can. <laughs> I mean, I can give you two examples, one from a parent of a primary school kid and one from a teacher. Um, and in both these cases, the schools had recently introduced 
um, social, critical social justice influenced anti-racist training. That is to say they had, they had hired either um, people to come in from third party organisations or they'd brought them, you know, uh, paid money for materials and course materials online stuff and that to um, implement either with their staff and or the pupils. Mm -hmm. So one mother said, you know, her, uh, this was a primary age, so we're talking six, five, six year old um, children here, who um, every day her child would be going to school, her child was mixed race, going to school with her white friend holding hands and one day she said she didn't couldn't hold didn't want to or couldn't hold hands with her friend anymore <clears throat> and her mother queried this with the with the child but the child was only 5 or 6 and mm. obviously couldn't really give a, a a reasoned out answer as to why she felt that so the mother then went to the school um I, and I mean there's a lot of inferring going on here this isn't kind of conclusive but it it, it kind of there's a lot of other evidential support and also logically thinking, logical reasoning. The school had recently started introducing anti-racist classes for those children. So, and you can see that the kind of, the kind of, and when we look at the kind of material that is being um, endorsed in schools, storybooks by um, quite often American authors, people like Anne Hazard, where they're, um, narrative is starts off from the assumption that Britain is uh, Anne Hazard is American but it's it's transferred uncritically to Britain that the country is absolutely racist to the core and that everybody who is not an ethnic minority has a duty to address atone apologize make up for the privilege that they hold because of their skin color so that narrative, those core assumptions really create, I think, a hypersensitivity around skin colour and race at the very time when in Britain um, we were really kind of getting over that <laughs> to a large degree. And certainly when I was growing up, um, my skin colour was a very, uh, very occasionally intruded on my consciousness as a child. Um, yeah. Generally, it was who I was, the friends I had, what I liked, what I didn't like, what books I read, what games we played, um, whether you liked sport or didn't like sport, were the kinds of things that influenced how you, who you made friends with. But now you can see that more often than not, children are being introduced to the idea that it is a le not only legitimate, but it is a duty to consider skin colour. Right. So in that sense, it's fundamentally divisive. You, you know, if that message is then reinforced throughout schooling with no alternatives being presented you're going to get quite intellectually and ethically stunted um, young people at the end of that process yeah so fundamentally what you're saying is that something clothed in the language of anti-racism is actually having pernicious racist effects in our society which actually uh, teach people that skin colour is significant and and it's a cause for increased segregation and increased uh, conflict whereas you know obviously a liberal what you might describe as a liberal democracy should be premised on a kind of universality approach where skin color doesn't matter and also that the law mm. obviously this is my interest as a, as a barrister and, and a mixed course, race yeah. barrister as well I, I might add um, the law uh, you know is is there to sort of uh, ensure that that uni those universal principles where everybody is equal before the law and forms of discrimination are not <coughs> uh, um, permitted by law and can be punished by law uh, th th that 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 would seem to be completely undermined in a way by what what you're saying and I just wonder if we could talk mm. a little bit about the relationship of the law to the problem because you're focusing DDU under I understand is focusing exclusively on schools. Yes, um, yes. So, so yeah. you're looking at the education system as a as a propagator of, mm. of, of of regimes of thinking, which which may in fact over the long term increase discrimination in our society and increase division and increase racial uh, um, discord. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What's the? Because obviously the George Floyd thing is one part of a long, uh, complicated history. But what 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 is what are the features of of, of the modern education system that you think are um, facilitating 
um, mm. a, 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 a sort of ra radical approach to politics from sometimes very young ages, where children are, you know, encouraged to have very strong views about things that perhaps are slightly outside of their world, their experience, yeah. their ability to understand. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's 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 this politicisation <coughs> of education all about? What, how do you well, read uh, it? The, my reading of it is that that the the current politicisation in favour of kind of social justice outlooks and values and political ideas in schools um, is, if you like, the latest iteration of a quite a, a, a long trend going back quite a few years of forms of instrumentalisation of education. Now, education at school level has all sorts of roles, right? It has different functions. You go to school to get qualifications to enter the workforce. You go to school to be socialised into norms of behaviour that are applicable beyond your immediate family and friends. It's a process of socialisation that is particularly important in when you have modern pluralistic <laughs> societies, right? So it depends in... Um, and that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that, right? As long as the core function of education also exists not just rhetorically, but the, in practice as well. And that core function of education is is not a, a kind of immediately social or empirical one. It's actually an intellectual and ethical one. It's to introduce the next generation into the forms of knowledge that have been created by, you know, successive generations over the ages, not in, as in the sense of handed down as tablets in stone, like a religious text, but that have survived, um, you know, several iterations of scrutiny, critique, changing, amending, rejecting, developing, so that we have the best knowledge to date. Now, that's that's a function, really, of higher education, of universities, postgraduate research work. But that, in Britain, you know, has had a fairly close relationship to the way school subjects have been formed and developed through exam boards. So there's a whole set of institutional relationships that have been assumed in the development of the English edu British educational system that have underpinned this liberal education. That These were all torn up. It was like a, literally a kind of ground zero in the late 80s. And those relationships were torn up. And I think there was a fundamental moral disorientation of the profession, while in the media the, the discussion was more political. It was around the curriculum and are we teaching what are we teaching, you know, what kind of British history are we teaching, you know, are we just focusing on Shakespeare too much, you know, the canon and all that. There was that kind of debate, which was important. But the, the deeper, less visible kind of moral vacuum that was created once you lost that sense of this is what teaching is about. You have an authority as a teacher, as, a, as an authority in your subject that is important because it's not just that children are learning the substantive knowledge, but they're learning how to take an objective view. And an objective view not just to truth claims by others, but an objective view to their own ideas of truth without that aspect of critical self-reflection which is, you know, it's not just, you don't just have one lesson on it, critical thinking, critical self-reflection, yeah. wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, that's it, done. Yeah. It's something that is inculcated over a long period of time at age-appropriate levels. Any notion of that today is, has disappeared. And it's, when, whenever you see, and as I've seen, many school policies on anti-racism or EDI that starts off with, we are an anti-racist school, or we have a duty to fight racism, then you might think, oh, that's the right thing to do. Good, isn't that good? But actually, no, it isn't. It's actually an abdication of their educational responsibility and it's accepting an abdication of adults in the political sphere to tackle racism and dump it on schools in another line of extra educational tasks that teachers are supposed to deal with very corrosive yeah i mean it for me once people start saying you know we have to fight racism i'm an anti-racist i'm my <laughs> i'm always slightly suspicious of people that phrase missions in that way because it's it sort of goes without saying i mean you don't you don't have schools declaring that they're going to fight paedophilia um, <laughs> yes. that they're committed to ending um you know s s trafficking and slavery i mean obviously if such a 
such a thing was going on in the school, they would have a duty to deal with it. Of course. Um, and if it yeah. were criminal, report it. You don't really need to state it as a, as a missive. So one wonders perhaps the disorder... We've talked about this a lot on, on, on this programme, such as the number of programmes we've had. We haven't had too many. But mm -hmm. in previous programmes, I've talked with people like Claire Fox mm -hmm. um, about the third sector, and she's also described a kind of moral disorientation uh, across public across the public sector which 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 she suggested was one of the reasons that these these third sector groups with their own agendas and their own partisan view of the world have been able uh, to move in quite 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 adeptly and if you like promote a narrative in schools that you know it's one of many narratives it's one way of looking at the world um Mm. If we say, for example, critical race theory is the idea that there is an inherent conflict between people of colour and white people, if you accept those categories, mm. I personally don't. That's a very Marxist way of seeing the world where there's a perpetual class struggle um, and it, it can only be resolved through violent revolution and creation of a proletariat state. So yeah. that's one political view of the world, certainly not the view of the world. No. So do no. you think these third sector groups are, are, are activists who, who simply see that moral, dis moral disorientation of, 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 of the organisation, of, of the school, um, of the idea of education? There's been a kind of abandonment of, yeah. of the notion of a, a liberal humanist education and in sweeps somebody who's got a very different idea of what they want children to learn and the, the field is clear. I, I think that's absolutely right, you know, and, and intellectually the ground has been prepared for them by the kind of prior um, devaluation of the standards of knowledge, you know, and the kind yeah. of knowledge differentiations. So, you know, it is, you know, when you have, for example, lessons in RE that are asking children to make their own version of a Bible by doing a fashion Bible, you can take, <laughs> you know, you don't need to be a, a, a theologian or an archbishop to see that something's really gone wrong here because they're confusing, like, the knowledge that you find in the Daily Mirror or the Sun or the Telegraph or the Guardian, that is the public sphere, with disciplinary knowledge that would belong to religious yes. education. Yes. And they have very different, the mean, it's, it's not like one is good, one is bad, one is true, one is lies. It's that they ha each sphere has different standards of truth criteria, you know, and we all of us are kind of spontaneously familiar with the everyday life and everyday knowledge, but it is a job of education to introduce people, younger people, to the more unfamiliar and more difficult standards and networks of meaning, if you like, that you know are involved in learning a disciplinary subject. So, you know, you can see, and all the pressures in education have been to make education and the syllabus and the curriculum relevant, to make it accessible, mm -hmm. to make it so everybody succeeds. And it's basically an abandonment of disciplinary standards, you know, yeah. that's, and so that ground has been prepared. And as you say, the moral disorientation that has come to the fore yeah. is the kind of final push at the door that is allowing, um, third party you know nobody has any scrutiny of these people well that's it right. nobody that's, has any that's, scrutiny that's, that's something that the bad law project's really interested in and we've got our own um, project within the bad law project called bad education and mm. I think you know we've spent a lot of time discussing what we think bad education is what makes bad education and we think it's very much a legal question uh, we have very good laws in this country good and uh, I don't want to talk about the Equality Act because <laughs> we haven't got six <laughs> yes, years um, yes. to do that but uh, yeah. the Equality Act for, in my view has some responsibility for the way policies are being drafted that, 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 that in a way can cave to the demands of very partisan activist groups yeah. but I don't want to talk about that now but if we look at the education <coughs> act which is a much simpler affair it does it does clearly state that that, that schools cannot be promoting partisan mm. uh, one-sided views particularly <coughs> of, of, of public uh, contested issues um, political issues that they have a duty under the education act to promote balance a balance of ideas um and i know that ddu is 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 you're you're you're, you're drafting a petition as we speak which you might want to say something about mm -hmm. um in relation to what you call indoctrination yes. which would seem to be a legal uh, abdication by schools of their duty under the Education Act not to indoctrinate. That's basically yeah. what the Education Act is saying. You can't indoctrinate. So right. how do you um, how how do you define um, 
indoctrination and maybe it would be very interesting for our viewers to to hear your your thoughts on why why it's even prohibited in the law uh, mm, in the first mm, place why do we have mm. that clause in the education act that says balance is really important uh, what 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 were they aiming yeah. what were they aiming to do with that and why were they aiming to do it well i mean i don't know the specific reasoning behind the education act but in terms of educational philosophical and sociological discussions um, the notion of impartiality is really, really important and it has quite a specific meaning within education and it's not one that's very well understood. Could, could you tell us what, how it's understood by educators? Yeah, yeah. It, it's to do with um, impartiality, it's to do with what's something I mentioned earlier, which is the idea of objectivity, right? It's, it's created, it's the idea that it is possible to create a discursive space mm -hmm. where you can, you are able to acknowledge the reasoning behind a series of views including those you disagree with now that's not relativism it doesn't mean you then think oh because i've because i've acknowledged them understood them they're all okay you then have to make a judgment but the point about education is that through, as you proceed through it you get you are able to make more accurate judgments as, as you you know you just become more familiar with the kinds of claims there so it's not really it's and often impartiality is understood as more narrowly political impartiality that's not quite right in education mm -hmm. right because you know it's not like that isn't really happening that well it is happening in some schools a lot of teachers particularly in certain areas of london and metropolitan areas are very openly for example anti-conservative and make no attempt to mm -hmm. hide that from their children sure. from their pupils for sure it's one thing to do that in a politics discussion with 16 17 year olds but i don't think it's legitimate to do with 10 year olds in a classroom no. but the what the more broader um uh, understanding and meaning of impartiality. Let me give you an ex a concrete example. And this is from a school that um, uh, a teacher sent in. So one of the uh, tasks, they were discussing the toppling of statues. And one of the tasks the children were set was um, to, for homework after the class discussion, was to um, look at questions like, well, you know, Edward Colston's gone, what alternative person would you have in its place discuss and that was it right and that might seem like balanced in a way but it actually isn't because what that is doing is sweeping off the board it's not even acknowledging the fact that there is a huge swathe of public legitimate public opinion that didn't think statues should be toppled in the first place mm -hmm. so it was assumed that the toppling of statues is no, it's a criminal, de facto it's a good criminal, thing. Criminal, criminal damage, one yeah. thing. But yeah. Well, that didn't come into it, right? It was, you know, you, you could say <laughs> there is a legal... You, you don't necessarily even have to do that in the class, as long as you acknowledge there is a question of legality here that we could look at another time. But none of that, right? It is just de facto assumed. So, and, you know, we have now a major example, the AQA, that is officially in saying it's going to... Um, bring an EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, frame to its specifications for GCSEs, and 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 I think I think with A levels have probably already done it. Now that is, you know, and on the surface, a very superficial reading, it seems like, oh, you know, extend the range of authors. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that the very concept of EDI, as currently understood in society, is a politically partisan concept mm -hmm. with a whole load of assumptions about what the majority of who happen to be white are like and what the minorities who happen to be non-white are like mm -hmm. and it's loaded right it's not a it, so there's a whole it's know, loaded but it's also as you said about this um impartiality field in education where there is a discursive yeah. space to create opportunities to ask questions unpack things like the problem i have is not that you have a partisan political ideology in schools but that there's no space yeah exactly to say look you know some people do think this and it's a very it's a very sensitive um, area and a lot of people are very passionate about it uh, but there are also people who take issue with it for xyz reasons it's that lack of space i think that's a really good way to put it yeah. that creates this claustrophobic feeling that a you can't <laughs> you can't say 
that you disagree with it. Yeah. And B, yeah. which is for me very insidious, is that you have to sign up to it. Exactly. And if you don't, yes. then you're a kind of quasi dissenting. Exactly. Without um, that discursive yeah. space, without that space for impartiality and objectivity, we makes it more difficult to have the partial loyalties that we all need as an individual. Yes. We have a loyalty to family, we have a loyalty to community, we have a loyalty to nation, and then we can be disloyal in certain and respects. And we change as well. our minds. Mm. And we change <laughs> our minds, exactly. Whereas if you if you don't have that, then it does become this very and that's what gives it this really aggressive and, you know, really yeah. kind of personal feel in discussions where it's, you know, you cannot you, it's like you're an anti-realist when it comes to ideas. It's like ideas have no reality of their own other than its expressions of you as yeah. a person and your intentions, your, eth your whole moral, ethical, political being, rather than, you know, like, I really don't, you know, I really do not agree with you on this, but what you're saying about this I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's a, it, 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 it's it so encourages dear. a yeah. very reductive, flattened out subjectivity. And, and it's also, what I forgot to say is how anti-democratic it is. Well, that, I was saying, it smacks yeah. of the Soviet Union to me. That's just... Totally. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. experience this as anti-white. Yeah. And, yeah. and it is in its form. It has mm. become very... Um, but I think, for me, I think the anti-white is accidental. I think the main driver is that it's anti-democratic. It's anti-majoritarian. Yeah. And it's this fear of the majority, yeah. as if the minority can't be there's tyrannical a party at view. times. There's a party view, and if you dissent from that, you are, well, in the Soviet times, you'd have been called bourgeois. No matter what you thought, or whether you were working class, or a yeah. factory worker, or a miner, or an artisan, you would have been bourgeois if you disagreed with the party on anything. And that's, yeah. I think, race plays a similar, similar role in our yes. society, that you yeah. are a racist if you, if you raise questions about dominant state um, and corporate ideologies that are, are being well it's not even if you raise questions Anna what we're seeing now is just like if you if you don't assent to it you yeah, have well, to kind it. of like compelled speech yeah. you, know, kind of, you have to act this is what act you know it's not enough to be anti-racist you have to be actively anti-racist yes that is you have to declare your support for ideas that personally were I ever to be asked to to declare my support for I would refuse yeah and I don't care what the cost would be, I would refuse. It is an abhorrent, divisive ideology that is extremely patronising for people, for actually non-white people, because yeah. it, it, it assumes we cannot have the universal standards brought to bear upon us, you know, because somehow it will... I we're, do find we're weaker it, I, I, or more I, I damaged. Do, I do find it really interesting how many people who, who are from minority ethnic backgrounds or mixed backgrounds, you know, like yourself, myself, mm how many of us are actually, you know, incensed by this stuff? Yes. And that never gets... We don't get our voices we're never, out we're there. Never, we're <laughs> never, we're never in, in, encouraged to express what we, we feel about it when, when it when it has personal implications for us, you know. Um, so then suddenly black voices and brown voices and minority voices just don't, don't matter. matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a that, that's yeah. a good place to actually We're bring white up. adjacent. <laughs> yeah. I like I like the ending. Um, we d we do have to wrap up because I know we're we're busy people, and um, I'm very grateful to have your time today, even though it was brief. Mm -hmm. I could do this uh, with you all day, and I'm I'm very happy to have you back anytime to continue this discussion because I think bad education, bad law, and DDU, I hope will be collaborating uh, definitely uh, in yeah. in one way or, or the other, and and I I would hope that you could use this. Um, uh, this show to promote anything that you want in terms of where you'd like uh, viewers to go to look at things. You've got a petition in the in the in the pipeline. Uh, where would you Just direct check, them? Yeah. Check out our website, www. Don't divide us. Um, we're on Twitter uh, and subscribe to. If you subs go to our website, subscribe to our newsletter. You will get full updates of events that we're going to be holding and regular you know regular meetings that we have and any you know our campaign work as well which we are as as you've kindly met you know flagged up we are going to be launching a petition and we are working on a follow-up report to the report we issued last year uh called who's in charge that was about um edi that providers at councils were using really important stuff yeah. i will definitely be yeah. looking at that and uh, hopefully even contributing to it <laughs> yeah. we'll see but so, um yeah, yeah it, absolutely yeah. lovely to have you in the studio we will welcome you back again i'm sure in 2023 yeah. um and for now thanks a lot happy new year and good luck with everything you're doing thank you anna same to you too and bad your bad law and bad education projects too. great thank you